Welcome, Duke alumni and friends, to this session of the Duke Alumni Forever Learning Institute, an interdisciplinary educational program organized in a set of thematic courses. I'm Joe Superna, the Senior Director for Faculty Engagement uh, and Duke Alumni Engagement and Development. And I'm really, really excited to have you all join us for the program today. Uh, this program is the Search for Wellbeing. It's part of our theme, Transformative Ideas, which is inspired by the program by the same title uh, for Duke sophomores through Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. In the Transformative Ideas program, students explore ideas of meaning, value, purpose, and the spirit uh, that challenge us as humans. And during our Forever Learning Institute version of Transformative Ideas, you're gonna get to engage with some of the same ideas that our current students with um, go through with these outstanding faculty from across the disciplines. I'm really excited. Uh, we're gonna be joined tonight by our moderator, Ray Jean Preshel Bell, who is a Duke alumna, class of 1993, and currently serves as a research professor of global health in the Duke Global Health Institute. It also happens that her office is located in her freshman residence hall, Trent Hall, which is just, I thought that was kind of like a really wonderful <laughs> full circle. So, you know, welcome to the Forever Learning Institute. Thanks so much. It's so great to be here and to be a Duke, a Duke alum working at Duke. Um, so today's session, it was inspired by the sophomore year experience course, Medicine and Human Flourishing, where students explore the history and practice of medicine and the search for well-being. And um, well-being is something that I study. It's conceived from many angles, physical, psychological, spiritual. Um, as a psychologist and a professor of global health, I study occupational mental health, specifically of workers who are called to their work. You know, when we're called to our work, we're likely to overextend ourselves and get ourselves um, in trouble, but also have a lot of meaning and purpose at the same time. Uh, so to share with you just one example, colleagues and I studied the mental well-being of caregivers of orphans in four different countries. And for those caregivers who all lived on different continents, they all shared an essential part of how they define mental well-being, and it was the ability to have their mind at peace. Um, and the ways that they stayed mentally strong in the face of really some pretty severe emotional and challenging work, it, it always involved being in community with others. So they turned to colleagues to remind them of why they do the hard work they do, and they turned to spending time with their the children they were caring for if that work gave them meaning, and it and it usually did. And they turned to people in their religious communities and their extended family to uplift them. And from all of this, I took that healing, whether it's mental or physical, it's rarely an individual endeavor. So today we're going to talk about what is the role of modern medicine in well-being? What matters in the relationship between the medical provider and patient? And we'll also delve into some of the contemporary debates of modern medicine and medical ethics, and we'll discuss fundamental questions about medicine's role in the meaning and purpose of human life. First, let me introduce you to our esteemed colleagues here today. So joining me in conversation are Far Curlin. He's a Josiah Trent Professor of Medical Humanities in the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanities, and the History of Medicine. We also have Warren Kinghorn. He's a Duke alumnus from the classes of 2002 and 11 and house staff from 2003 to 2007. He serves as an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, and he's jointly appointed within the Divinity School as co-director of the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative. He also serves as the Esther Cauliflower Associate Research Professor of Pastoral and Moral Theology. And we have Sneha Mantri, Assistant Professor of Neurology and Director of Medical Humanities in the Armstrong Scholars Program. Welcome to each of you. And, um, and I'd love it if you would share with us and here a brief introduction of you and your work. Um, so far, if we could start with you, that'd be great. Thanks, Ray Jean. I am a general internist who then moved into hospice and palliative medicine and was on the faculty of the University of Chicago for a number of years before having the delight of joining the Duke faculty 10 years ago. Um, 
And my work has focused on the intersections of medicine, ethics, and religion. I've been particularly interested in the way that um, different religious commitments uh, track on to different understandings of what medical practitioners are reasonably up to in the practice of medicine and um, what kinds of things are fitting um, for uh, what kinds of uses of medicine for responding to the various parts of the human predicament that we, that we encounter. And um, at Duke, along with Warren, I've had the pleasure of leading this, this initiative on theology, medicine, and culture in the Divinity School, which is an unusual thing in that we have a place between a divinity school and a medical school that are closely uh, closely located where we can dig into some of those big questions that humans have struggled with for all of all of history. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Warren, you want to go next? Sure. I, well, I'm honored to be here tonight with some really terrific colleagues and with with all of you. I'm Warren Kinghorn. I'm a psychiatrist in the medical center with a clinical practice at the Durham VA. Uh, I also have cross-training in theological ethics, and I have a faculty appointment at the Divinity School, where I work with a number of colleagues, including Far, on uh, really uh, digging into these big questions of medicine, especially from theological perspective. Um, I also uh, work with the Keenan Institute for Ethics on a program called Reimagining Medicine. It's a summer undergraduate medical humanities program, again, to, to ask big questions like what is medicine for and what is health and how does health relate to a community um, and i'm also involved in a duke bass connections uh, project on trauma informed teaching and learning um, my work is uh, really centered on uh, questions of uh, the connection between uh, health and uh, health care and religious communities especially christian religious communities I've also done some thinking and writing on the role of the therapeutic relationship in psychiatry and especially in mental health prescribing. Uh, and look forward to being in conversation about all of these questions tonight. Wonderful. And Sneha? Yeah, um, I'll echo what uh, my colleagues have said. I'm very honored to be part of this conversation. Um, and I'm really looking forward to both our panel and um, our conversation breakouts. Um, I'm a neurologist by training. Uh, my clinical practice specializes in the care of people with Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonism um, with a particular emphasis on neuropalliative care and uh, interdisciplinary care for this population um, and sort of reducing some of the access barriers that we see um, as people get older um, and their mobility may be and then uh, my other big hat here at Duke um, is uh, really within the School of Medicine uh, as Director of Medical Humanities, managing a lot of our programs for medical students and other health professional learners. Um, the Armstrong Scholars Program that Regine alluded to is a longitudinal track uh, that we've been able to start within the School of Medicine, really um, asking the med students to think about what draws them into medicine, starting from you know their very first week on our campus, um, and taking them through um, you know all four years of, of really kind of questioning what brings you here, what drives you, and how can we help you maintain that drive through all of the challenges of med school, and give them the skills that they'll need as they enter residency and clinical practice. So oh, good. That's great. It's wonderful to see kind of a, a range of expertise. And so I'm going to ask you our, our next question and to draw on that. So I think I'm going to share the poll results. I'm not sure if it's my job, but I'm going to, going to click share. Does this allow you all to see? It does. All right. So take, take a peek. And then my question for, um, for you all here on the panel is like, what do you what do you think of these results and how might you answer the same question from your own um, perspective and really anyone who wants to go first well i i will um i'll go first you know i think it seems both to practitioners of medicine and to patients that what we don't want to be is reductionistic and we don't want to limit medicine to just looking for biomedical abnormalities and trying to stamp them out. Um, we are, we are healing, not, we're not, we're not after health in the abstract. We're, we're looking to, to heal 
real people who have rich lives that involve um, all kinds of uh, meaning and and goods and sufferings that that uh, we have to be attentive to as medical practitioners. And yet, I, I have uh, one of the areas of my own work has been arguing that it one of the problems that afflicts medicine today is. Um, is a kind of agnosticism about what it's for and an openness to medicine being for everything that people value, that people consider to be part of their well-being broadly conceived. So my answer would be the, the role of medicine is to preserve and restore health principally. And then in the preserving and restoring of health, we of course promote well-being. That's the particular kind of contribution medicine offers uh, to human well-being is attention to health in people whose health is injured or threatened. And along the way, of course, we relieve sickness. That's part of restoring health. And we relieve suffering that flows out of deficiencies or injuries to health. But I think it's important that medicine not try to just relieve any suffering and um, not try to promote well-being writ large, lest it become just basically a power that people use um, in whatever way they they seem they think is best. Thank you. Who, any other response? Anybody think something a little different? I know Warren thinks a little different. I want to hear, uh, I'm happy to speak, but I want to defer to Sneha and then I can speak. Um, I mean, I think you know, the, the way the question is worded, right, I think always, um, as someone is alluding to in, in chat, um, does sort of emphasize the all of the above, um, because I think it does have a role, you know, across the, uh, across all of those different aspects, you know. Um, I love the idea of medicine um, as promoting and restoring health. Right, like as as um, as far alluded to, not just focusing on the sickness and suffering which we see every day in our patients, but really trying to go beyond that and and understand what a person's goals are, their values are, what their story is, and how their illness, whatever that may be, um, has shaped story of their life and continues to shape the story of their life. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work in the Parkinson space with sort of interviewing and, and trying to understand the lived experience of a complex chronic neurodegenerative condition for which there is currently no cure. And so, so much of what I do clinically is helping patients live well with Parkinson's. Our interdisciplinary clinic is now called the Thrive Clinic because we're really trying to emphasize that, you know, yes, you have Parkinson's, but there's so many other aspects of your life that are important. And how can we as practitioners honor and understand uh, that? And just resonating with some of what my colleagues have said, uh, I, I teach a class at the Divinity School that includes an essay by the Kentucky poet and farmer and essayist Wendell Berry. And the title is called Health is Membership came out in the mid 1990s. And one of the things that Wendell Berry says in this essay, he says that I, I believe that a community uh, in the broadest, in the, the broadest sense, a place and all its creatures is the smallest unit of health. And that to speak of the health of an isolated individual is a contradiction in terms. And as a psychiatrist, I, I feel that as I see patients at the Durham VA, um, they come to me as individuals. I work with them as individuals. I seek their flourishing as individuals, but uh, they teach me that we all exist in this complex network of interconnected wholes, that we exist in relationship with each other and with our communities and with the land around us. Um, and so in some ways, yes, I think that the, the clinician, maybe in all of our cases, specifically the physician is, is thinking about promoting the health of individuals, but but we have to see those individuals as connected within stories and communities um, beyond simply the the body alone or beyond the individual alone. And I think we have to be attentive to that. And that needs to be part of what informs the way that we advise and walk with our patients. Each of you said said something really 
interesting there about um, Sneha. I, I liked how you were talking about um, the story, the individual story, and how their illness has has shaped their story. And then Warren, you're talking about health not just being an individual, but shaped by the community. And far, you mentioned I I got the sense toward the end of what you were saying that maybe you were a little worried about medicine becoming too broad and trying to and trying to do too much. Um, and I'm I'm trying to grapple with that with um, stories like an individual's lifetime story or the whole the whole community wrapped around. Um, could you, far could you say more about? Um, are you concerned that medicine could try to do too much? I am. I am very much. My wife and I laugh. Um, we regularly have some kind of back and forth where she will have a symptom or one of our kids will have a sign of something and she will say, you know, we need to, this needs to be seen. I'm going to take this to see urgent care or a doctor. And, and one of the, one of the, t- the part of this back and forth is her sense that if you have a problem in the body and you can see that there's a problem, you go see medical professionals. And I living within medicine think, well, there's a, there's a key question there. And that is, is this the sort of problem for which going to see medical professionals is likely to be a helpful, uh, a helpful thing to do, all things considered. And so one of, one of the problems with, I think one of the stories that we tell about medicine in our time is that, um, and this partly takes off of the problem of individualization that Warren was speaking about and Snea was speaking about, is that we, we have this idea that if a part of one's story or if one story can be told in a medical way, then the medical story is to become the dominant story. It has to push out other things. So we saw this, I think, with the COVID, for example, when we watched, as I watched in hospice and palliative medicine, um, well-meaning people, well-meaning policies, but blocking elderly people from and dying people from being seen by their husbands and wives and pastors and and so on was a moment, I think, where in hindsight, we can see that it's a problem if we make the medical story the whole story. Um, similarly, um, there are lots of types of suffering, including different kinds of chronic pain, um, dis-ease. Um, this bleeds over some into the mental health world. Um, and so this part of the real challenge that mental health practitioners have is making discernments where the lines are not really clear between that kind of suffering that's part of the human condition that's not helpfully medicalized, that actually medicalizing it can make it worse, um, not least by imposing medical treatments that have their own sets of burdens and often don't have great prospect of helping. Um, So I think one of the central tasks for a good medical practitioner and the central discernments for a good or for a wise patient is to see the limits of medicine, the gift of medicine and its limits, and distinguish between the places where medicine is helpful from the places where it has basically a pretense of offering help that it really can't deliver on. Neha, I see you nodding. Yeah, I just, I, I so much agree with what you're saying there, Far. Like none of us are surgeons by training, but I've sometimes heard it said, you know, the difference between a good surgeon and a great surgeon is that the great surgeon knows when not to cut, right? Like what are the, what are the spaces in which as, as medical professionals, we need to acknowledge those limits and, and recognize that the needs of the patient are you know not necessarily something that um, would be fixed by a surgery or a pill or a, you know whatever medicalized intervention that we're so heavily trained in through med school and residency and so on. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think is so neat about some of our programs here at Duke is that we're really trying to help our pre med students or medical students or our clinicians rethink the the role of the physician or the clinician in that space like walking with somebody in their illness has so much value um that i think gets under recognized or lost in traditional medical training um and yet that is the thing that has the power 
to really make a difference for patients on a, on a very, very deep level. Yeah, I just resonate with what both of you are saying. Uh, the, if you look on the website of the Amer American Psychiatric Association, which is my professional guild, uh, it'll say that psychiatry is the branch of medicine focused on the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders, um, which sounds great, um, except that like, no disorder ever walked into my office at the VA. You know, like I never, I never like was walking down the street and major depressive disorder came and struck up a conversation with me. I mean, it's, it's not disorders that we treat, it's people and people are always more complex than any label applied to them. Um, they always bear stories. They're always um, irreducible to any of our medical ways of dicing and cutting things and, and making sense of things. And I think what, I think what, what's, what stories not the medical story, but what broader human stories help us with is that it helps us not to reduce people to those medical categories. And and I think what both Far and Sneha are calling from is uh, that clinicians need wisdom uh, to know what it what does it mean in a particular situation to discern what the right thing is to offer to a patient, uh, maybe what the right good is to pursue. And I think that kind of discernment is really important. Um, and. And I think that, frankly, that's what is hard about medical training. I mean, I, I tell people, rightly or wrongly, that you know, a, an undergraduate spending a few weeks with the with our diagnostic manual and with a few treatment algorithms could probably learn how to diagnose and treat basic forms of mental disorders. Um, but uh, that's not that hard to do, at least on a very basic level. What's hard to do is to know what to do when things are complex and complicated, as they usually are. And that's what takes years. And and that's what I think we want to cultivate in our students and trainees at Duke. I, I'm noticing that the word stories is is arising a lot, um, as well as people's experiences. I, I wonder if there are stories that we tell about medical practice or that you all see see told. And, and if those stories help promote flourishing or maybe get in the way of well-being, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think about story a lot. Um, I have a master's degree in narrative medicine, and I'm a writer. And, and so my world um, and the way that I approach care is really through stories and, and storytelling. Um, and I just think it's so um, restrictive sometimes the way that we traditionally teach medical students and residents to tell a patient story. Um, you know, the first year medical students, when I when I meet with them during their again, their like very first week of med school, um, are so good at eliciting a story from a standardized patient or from me as a faculty member pretending to uh, you know, have a, a, a minor illness um, where we're teaching them the basics of, of history taking. Um, and then I see them again as second year medical students on their neurology rotation, and they've gotten so boxed in to the the format of the medical progress, you know, which is a very restrictive way of telling a person's story. You know, it starts with a chief complaint and then you've got a, you know, history of present illness and it's very, very structured, which it certainly has its place. But I think if you wed yourself to that form of storytelling, you're losing so much richness about what really matters to the patient. Um, and I think, you know, having been on the other side of this as well, as a family member of, of a patient, um, like people can tell when you're, you know, when you're, which story you're using, I guess, or if you're, or if you're got, you know, this medical story in mind, um, or if you're open to their story and their, their version or, or their experience um, of their illness. Um, and so I think it's, it's really critical that we, um, that we teach our learners and we practice ourselves to be open to the way that people tell their story and how, again, how the illness story may intersect with all of the other pieces of their lives and their communities um, that matter to them. I, I love being a psychiatrist. So I'm, I've been saying critical things about psychiatry, but I love the work of psychiatry. But I think that psychiatry often tells much too simple stories, very much like I was describing. Um, one way of telling that story is what I what I think of as a kind of machine like way of thinking about assembly line. And and here's how it typically works: 
people come to us with unwanted or disvalued experience and behavior. Uh, it's kind of a broad way to say it. And we recognize that as symptoms. Like we have labels that we apply. We say, oh, I recognize this experience as symptoms of something. And then we gather together our symptoms and we uh, cluster our symptoms into broader labels called diagnoses. And then once we have diagnoses like generalized anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder, then we reach to our clinical practice guidelines and we apply certain kinds of techniques and technologies which treat those diagnoses. And then, of course, we can buy and sell and those treatments and technologies, and that's how the healthcare system works. And I, one thing I've, I learned in my psychiatry residency here at Duke is that it's it's dangerously easy to see a patient for a psychiatric intake and to have a conversation with them about their symptoms and to assign diagnoses and even to start a treatment plan without knowing almost the slightest bit of the broader story of their life, because you can just ask about symptoms. And I had the, uh, this experience working at the Durham VA as a resident where I diagnosed dozens of veterans with PTSD because I could recognize the symptoms. And then I realized that I didn't know much at all about what it was like to be at war in Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan. And when I began to listen to those stories that d didn't appear on any diagnostic chart, I began not only to build better relationships with my patients and to understand their experience more, but I began to see new possibilities for treatment. I began to see them as not just reducible to diagnoses, but as, as human people. And I think we have to get away from those two simple ways of speaking. And I'll, I'll just say, Reggie, and listening to my patients' stories, um, what has struck me over now a couple of decades of taking care of people at the end of life who have illnesses that they know are going to take their lives in the relatively near term is how much um, we can be formed to believe that um, medicine holds a lot of power to protect us from our mortality that my experience and I review the data suggests we just don't have. And the way this gets expressed often is people being on 15 medications, even though they're dying of stage four cancer, and the medications might be for low bone mineral, bone mineral density or a little bit elevated blood pressure or, um, you know, a depression that they were diagnosed with eight years ago. And it's not clear if they're even still depressed or whether the medicine should be on there, a sleep medicine, they're not sure they're benefiting from before, any longer. But there's often a sense that you can't stop those things because if you don't cooperate with the medical treatments, you know, you're, you're going to, things are going to come apart. Or conversely, when I'm being talking to family and friends, people have a sense that, you know, they know they carry risk factors that threaten their future mortality, whether they're middle-aged or they have high cholesterol or they're 20 pounds overweight or their dad or mother died of a stroke when they were 65 or, you know, you, you can fill it in. Somebody had breast cancer. And there's um, often an anxiety that, or in a sense that if, if you cooperate with what medicine proposes for you to do, it will keep you from suffering similar fates. Um, at least can offer you a lot of confidence about that. And I think um, that's a story that doesn't turn out to be as true as medicine would like it to be and as patients would like it to be. So what I find myself doing now, not infrequently, is is um, giving people permission to focus on the things that, that, going back to where we started, all those other aspects of human well-being, friendships, the place you belong, your work, the celebrations you can be a part of, the trip you want to take, the writing you want to do, whatever it is, um, and uh, not feel as compelled to cooperate with all of the medical strategies that might be offered to you. Um, unless, and of course, this is, this requires good judgment, as Warren said earlier, um, uh, you don't want to forego things that really are clearly beneficial. But a lot of what we do is... Uh, has little prospect of helping the person we're, we're treating. So e each of you in your own way are getting at over-medicalization, whether, whether you're talking about how we look at chief complaints and 
and put that in a box, or we look at diagnoses and symptoms and not not the person and their lived experience, or trying to extend life at all costs and stick with that medical plan that's been brought together by lots of providers. Um, how how what do we do about that? Like, how do you keep your practices and medicines? your practice in medicine from being over medicalized and keep it patient centered. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go first here. I, I, for me, it's the importance is to, to be, to look squarely in the eye, both the good that medicine offers and its limits, which, which involves often knowing simple things like the difference between a relative risk reduction and an absolute risk reduction and thinking not in terms of population numbers and control, which, Physicians, when we read the literature, we see results published for populations of people who've been in a study. But when we're seeing a patient, we need to think with them about what a treatment is likely to offer them, not what it offers a thousand people like them. Um, and and then I think going back to that poll question, um, the, the, the question I'm always trying to reason with patients about is all things considered, like with, given the reality of your illness, your age, your, your situation, your vocation, the things you hope for, and so on. What are the things that medicine offers you that 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 off where you can realistically look forward to a benefit that is proportionate to the foreseeable burdens, whatever those are, time, energy, distraction, money, side effects of medications, et cetera. And just talking that way, rather than talking about what's medically indicated or what's approved or what people generally do, um, opens up into questions about what's really important in life and allows us to be appreciative of medicine's good while, while also being free to respectfully decline some of the things that it offers. For me, really, I mean, the thing that keeps my practice alive if you will, is, is the curiosity, the curiosity about the human person in front of me, you know, not, necessarily in a doctor shit way, but just two humans sitting down together in, you know, a pokey little exam room in my clinic and and asking like, tell me what's happening to you today. Um, right. And and leaving that space open for whatever it is that that, that person needs to say. Um, and, you know, having, I will say, one of the lovely things about the space that I work in is that we do have this interdisciplinary approach. And so if somebody in the moment needs a social worker or needs a, and we have an outpatient chaplain now in our clinic or needs a physical therapist or something, I have those folks on site that I can kind of tap on. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, what, what keeps me going clinically is, is that ability to connect just one-on-one -on -one with another human being who's often had a tremendously interesting life um, if you just ask about it. Yeah, I, I think when you use the term like medicalization, I think there's maybe two extremes to avoid. And most Mostly when people talk about medicalization, they, they what they're concerned about is that areas of, of life um, suddenly become claimed under the authority of medicine with the, with the physician as the authority over that part of life. And so in psychiatry, we talk about how shyness became social anxiety disorder or how nervousness becomes um, generalized anxiety disorder. And, and I think that that is important to avoid that. But it, the, the, the problem there is not that, that clinicians are trying to be helpful in a certain area. The, the problem is with that mechanistic way of thinking that I was describing earlier. I think the other extreme to avoid in my perspective is, is that um, in an effort to avoid medicalization, we would just say there just are certain aspects of um, the way that humans live and that are relevant to to health that doctors just have no business speaking into at all and should just stay completely away from. And I don't think that that's right either, because I think we are interconnected with each other. We live our how we live in the world and in relationships and uh, in our bodies is is relevant to our health. And so I think I'd prefer to think of the clinician as. Um, keeping a holistic view in terms of what's going on in someone's life, um, being able to make observations about that, but to be humble about, about our, our authority in any situation and to be thinking about like, how does our 
training prepare us to speak well into certain things and not into others and know what our limits are. So to have a broad view, but an humble sense of our own um, capacity to solve things. Uh, and I think that that can lead to uh, a healthy balance of those two. This is a lot of food food for thought, that tension between over-medicalizing or being over overly broad and going into all values and in, in all areas of life. Um, but we have some time to talk about that. And um, we're going to transition into breakout sessions. Okay. All right. So we are we are back again. I hope you had a lovely discussion. I know that I know that we did in our in our group. Um, and I just I've got one more question for the the panelists, which is what is something that you want our audience here to walk away with? today after after this conversation and so um so i'll just share for myself something that um came up in in my group that i really love that i would want you all to walk away with is which is that you can give your medical provider feedback on how much of your life you want them to pay attention to so if they're going to narrow medically you could you could tell them that they're missing something and if they're going too broad and you feel like they're they're beyond the scope of what you want as a in your experience you can actually mention that and i'll say as a psychologist that giving positive feedback to anyone really works and is a great thing and um i might not have thought of doing that to my doctors before today so thank you for that tip group um and the the rest of you uh panelists what would you what do you want to leave our audience with my group got stuck with the psychiatrist, so I apologize to all of you that were assigned to me. But uh, we talked a lot about mental health language and uh, what that and the power that language has and some of the limits of language. Um, and there were really good questions, and I really appreciated the the group's uh, engagement. Uh, one one thing that I used to do when I would supervise as an attending psychiatrist in the emergency department of the Durham VA uh, and in the psychi psychiatry service um, is that uh, psychiatry residents and medical students would come and would present cases to me and we'd give a formulation. And typically the formulation was the kind of formulation that Sneha was talking about, like a lot of clinical jargon. And so, you know, you'd have a 54 year old man with history of um, major depressive disorder, PTSD and alcohol use disorder who presents with suicidal ideation. It would go on like that, just with a lot of clinical language. And uh, I got to where I would sometimes stop and say, fantastic, thank you for that assessment. Now, please give me the assessment again, not using a single clinical term. And it's amazing how hard it is for residents and medical students to do that. And yet sometimes when people would force themselves to do that and not to use a single clinical term, um, the truth of the situation would emerge in different ways and new possibilities for what they needed would emerge in different ways that might look up more like finding solutions in their community and less like just enacting what the medical system could offer. And I would just, uh, that's an ongoing challenge to me in my practice. I was just gonna say in our group, we talked about the challenge of sustaining genuine empathy for patients and real connections, particularly in an age of AI. Um, this, it, it, if you look back over in medical writing over the course of the 20th century, people have worried about the distance that practitioners have from patients and the way they tend to treat them as machines and so on um, for decades, but um, the challenge is only going to get, you know, more so with, with AI. And yet the thing that patients long for and the thing that practitioners, I, I think, also long for is really to connect with one another as fellow human beings in this. We have a chance to encounter and um, work together uh, toward the healing that's possible with the resources that are available. Um, a humble practice, as Warren said earlier, but a really worthy one. And in my group, we talked about a bunch of different things, but I, the, the thread that ties it all together is the importance of bringing in many voices um, into these conversations as we you know, think about how to shape healthcare in the 21st century. Um, and particularly for those of us who are involved in resident teaching and medical student teaching and, and thinking about the future of healthcare, how can we make it a, a better space for patients, for practitioners, um, and really for all of us to be able to promote and restore health 
um, and well-being. Well, listen, th thank you all panelists for your stories and, and how you think about the stories of your your patients and medicalization and fighting against that. And, um, and I want to thank the whole audience here for um, for coming tonight and really thinking deeply about how do we engage in this world um, in our whole lives and our values.